One and welcome to another Ninja One webinar. Uh, we have quite a packed schedule. Uh, we do have another webinar that's going to be on Tuesday, September 24th, regarding uh, advanced automation in Ninja One. Uh, so pretty excited about that one. We'll go ahead and drop a link in the chat if anybody has not registered for that and you would like to. Uh, now for today, a brief bit of housekeeping. As always, this session is being recorded. So this will be sent out to you probably tomorrow via email, and it's also going to be posted to our YouTube channel. Uh, so you'll have this recording certainly after everything, uh, after we're done with the webinar. The other note here is that if you do have any questions as I'm going through everything, it is much easier for me to keep track of the Q&A. Uh, we have quite a large audience today, so I think the idea of me being able to look at the chat uh, it's probably going to be a bit of a pipe dream. Uh, so please, uh, if you have any questions, make sure you put those in the Q&A, and I will try to get to as many of those questions as I can. Uh, lastly, we do have a giveaway. Uh, there's nothing that you need to do to enter for that giveaway. Simply by registering and showing up today, uh, you have been entered, uh, and our winner will get their choice of one of four pretty good prizes. And we'll bring Andrew out towards the end to go ahead and announce that. Uh, with that, we can continue on to the main event, which is the 6.0 release of Ninja One. Uh, now, I think this is probably what everybody really wants to know here, which is when does this all come out? So if you're in the Canadian instance, this was uh, released last night. And so primarily most of my demo today is going to be inside of the Canadian instance. Uh, if you are in APAC or the OC, the OC instance, uh, you may be asleep right now, but you are also in the process of receiving the 6.0 release that actually is starting, I think, right now. Uh, and then, of course, for anyone uh, in the EU, that's projected for next week. And then after that, we'll see it roll out to our U.S. instances, landing in our, uh, our main U.S. instance on October 9th. Uh, now, to caveat all of this, this is subject to change. The last thing that we want to do is stick to a release date. Uh, when we know that release has an issue and we don't want to impact our partners. Uh, so there could be a delay here. Of course, we certainly hope there won't be one, uh, but I did want to make sure everyone knew that these dates are subject to change. Uh, with that, what is in the 6.0 release? What are we going to be talking about today? So for the most part, everything that I am talking about today it is contingent on the 6.0 release. So something like SysTray script execution, uh, if you're in the NA instance or the EU instance, you're not going to have the ability to see that feature. Uh, now, one thing at the very top here, the new template library scripts, that is the exception. Uh, this is something that is available to everyone right now. We actually dropped a new launch of uh, template library scripts, and that was last week, I believe. I think that was last Wednesday. Uh, so now, regardless of what regional instance you're in today, you will have access to uh, all the new template library scripts that were dropped. This brings our total to up to 240. Uh, and if anyone was a Ninja partner at the beginning of the year, you'll remember that the uh, template library was significantly smaller on January 1st, 2024, compared to how it is now. So I'm really happy that there's this ongoing commitment to bringing in new scripts as well as updating older ones to make sure that they stay uh, consistent and uh, operational. Uh, we will use some of those new template library scripts with the new SysTray script execution functionality. Uh, this lets you grant the ability to run an automation to your end user. Uh, we have a little SysTray and you can build out menu options in there. And one of the options is now to run an automation. And so we'll talk about how what use cases there are for this. Of course, I think self-service application install for end users is a critical one. But I think there's also some ability to take care of uh, troubleshooting, uh, giving troubleshooting capabilities to the end user so that they can try to self-diagnose what the issue is, uh, while also reducing some, some other ticket volume uh, that comes up with end user self-service requests. We'll also talk about our warranty tracking. This is moving into an open beta with the 6.0 release. Uh, this is something that anybody can try out now. Uh, go ahead and reach out to your account manager. Uh, however, right now, if you're not on 6.0, there's only the Dell manufacturer available for warranty tracking. The 6.0 release is going to expand the warranty tracking feature to encompass Dell, Toshiba, Lenovo, and HP. So there's going to be significantly more manufacturers than there are in the, uh, the 5.9 version of this beta. Uh, however, if you are primarily a Dell shop, 
definitely reach out to your account manager today so that you can get that feature enabled. Uh, if you are using Lenovo, Toshiba, and HP, you're certainly going to see a lot more value out of this with that 6.0 release because we'll be able to natively report on the warranty tracking uh, for that. And in case anybody missed that announcement earlier this week, uh, we did announce that warranty tracking is going to be an included feature with a Ninja One subscription, no additional cost there, uh, which I think is tremendous value, uh, especially when you consider what other services that track warranty uh, information do charge. So that's a huge value add, I think, for Ninja One. We'll also talk about our enhancements to image backup. This is, I would say, a complete reimagining of how image backup works under the hood. Uh, so we can now do uh, deduplication. We can do chainless backups. Uh, so there's no need to periodically take a full backup. And of course, we are now using immutable storage if you're backing up into the cloud. Uh, Ninja licenses AWS S3 storage to our partners. And that, as of the 6.0 release, will be immutable storage across the board, both for image backup as well as file and folder backup. We'll also talk about Ninja One documentation, which has been available for quite some time. Uh, but I would say right now we can say this is officially a launched feature. Uh, we have, I think, parity with a lot of other documentation platforms out on the market. And so we'll talk about the value that you can find for that inside of Ninja One. This gives you the ability to store your institutional knowledge that's tied to your IT team or to your clientele inside of the same platform where you're already going to be managing their endpoints on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense. It also gives you the ability to create checklists uh, so that you can keep everybody on track, everybody's following the proper procedures, and it also includes the ability to create a knowledge base. And that knowledge base can be accessible to technicians you can also then share those articles with end users who log in the Ninja, or you can create a public link that everybody will have the ability to access. Uh, so some really good functionality there. We'll dive into that. We'll talk about some miscellaneous enhancements that don't fit into their own individual bullet point. Uh, and then we'll also talk about some new early access features that'll be available with the 6.0 release. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my Ninja One instance so that we can kick off our demonstration. Okay, I'm glad the audio is okay. <clears throat> uh, so we will start with the new template library scripts. Uh, now, for starters, I would go ahead and recommend you look at our new announcements because we do have this handy article here that breaks down all of the new scripts as well as what updates we had to existing scripts inside of Ninja One. Uh, so I'll go ahead and paste this into the chat right now just so everybody has access to it. Uh, so here, I'll just point out a few of my favorites here that I think are going to be particularly useful. Uh, of course, the ability to deploy a Wi-Fi profile or SSID profile to a device, I think that's tremendously helpful with device provisioning. Uh, some of you may have seen a video that I did on device provisioning. It's on our YouTube channel, and it goes through the process of imaging a device with a PowerShell module called OSD Cloud. Uh, and how we can include the Ninja One agent as a part of that process. And the Ninja One agent essentially installs and does everything you need to actually get the device set up. Uh, and so now we actually have that native iteration of the Wi-Fi profile script just to help with laptops where you do want to include those credentials uh, at the time of configuring the device. Uh, enabling macros or disabling macros in Microsoft Office, this is an incredibly common um, endpoint hardening measure uh, that is recommended by a lot of things like CIS benchmarks or DOD STIGs. Uh, of course, I would always recommend that you test uh, anything that is considered an endpoint hardening measure, simply because you may have some very surprised people who uh, go, why can I no longer use macros in any of my office products? Uh, so this could have a downstream impact on business operations. So always good to take that into consideration before deploying to production. Uh, pinning taskbar items right here. This does need to be run from an admin account. System isn't going to be able to get the job done. Uh, the PK fail vulnerability check right there. Uh, secure token check. We uh, In our last script to Palooza, we talked about the ability to create a secure token for Mac OS patching purposes. And this just gives you the ability to report on this a little bit better. Uh, we can set our default file type associations. I think this is another thing that would be really useful for device provisioning. And then if we go down a little bit further, we will see my favorite one, the system performance check. This one is awesome. 
Uh, this collects a whole bunch of information from the device and then puts it into a custom field. Uh, custom fields in Ninja allow you to store information in a variety of ways. And in this particular case, we are using a WYSIWYG field, or what you see is what you get. And this lets us do custom HTML and CSS formatting so that we have the ability to create something that looks very nice and neat and is well formatted. Uh, and so if we uh, go into Ninja One here, and let's say I go down to uh, this device, I can then go into my custom field. If we scroll down a little bit, you will see this right here. This is our system performance check. And so all we needed to do was create the WYSIWYG custom field and allow that to be written to from an automation. And so this script here will go ahead and give us when this system performance check took place, when the last startup time was, information on the processor, on the memory, on the processes using CPU and memory, on our network usage, on our disk usage, uh, IO processes here, uh, WinSAT scores, recent error events. Uh, and then down here, we have a speed test. Uh, and so this takes, I think, some other scripts that uh, we've had to report on some of these elements individually. And we've kind of coalesced this all into one giant custom field that you get, which I think could be a very useful. Uh, so definitely would recommend checking out the template library scripts. There is a lot of uh, good value in there. So let's go ahead and talk about the SysTray script execution, because I think that's going to be tremendously valuable for people. Now, if we go into administration and then we go into the branding section, you'll see that we have a SysTray tab here. Now you can create a multitude of SysTrays. You're not restricted to just one. And this is really useful, especially for managed service providers where you might need to change the branding or change the menu options available depending on your individual client. Uh, so, but I also think that if you have multiple organizations and you do want to provide those uh, different menu options, that also works for anybody who is not an MSP. Uh, now let's go into this particular one right here. Uh, you can see what this is going to look like. Uh, this lets us build out a menu tree of what our end users are going to have uh, the ability to access. Uh, I like this one here. This is especially helpful for troubleshooting scenarios uh, where the device, excuse me, the user uh, might not necessarily know what their device is called. Uh, I've certainly had plenty of issues where somebody says, oh, I'm on this device by, uh, you know, the, in the back, by the back office. And you go, I don't know what that is. I don't know what the office looks like. Uh, and so being able to identify the name of the device, uh, this is a very uh, handy capability to go ahead and give them the ability to pop this up on the screen so that they can then read it off to you. And it's much easier to search and find the device by, for example, its host name that we see right here. But that's just one example. There's a lot you can do. The Help request form allows you to submit a ticket to either a ticketing system or a support email address. Uh, that's very handy as well uh, and kind of remove, uh, solves a lot of the issues of identifying the device. Uh, but of course, a lot of times people call up. And that's where device identification really comes in handy. Uh, now, you can also create these subfolders here. These are going to be called groups uh, in the menu options here. And you can see I've grouped together uh, some applications that you can see right here. So software installs, this is what my end user is going to have the ability to install. Uh, they have Google Chrome, and they also have VS Code as options. And so let's go ahead and take a look at what this actually looks like. Uh, hopefully, and I'll double check here to make sure I shared my screen the right way. Yes, I did. Uh, hopefully, you can see here my Ninja remote window. Uh, I am dialed into this device, and if I go down here to the very bottom and look at my SysTray, You'll see the icon right here. And if I click on that icon, I have the menu tree of everything that I can click on. So if I click on about my device, this is the device identification thing we spoke about earlier. Uh, you can see that right there, that's the name of the device. They just need to read that off to me and I'm able to find it uh, through Ninja One using the global search bar at the very top of your dashboard. Uh, but let's look at the actual implementation of installing applications. So let's say I need Google Chrome because I don't have Google Chrome on this device. I am using Microsoft Edge, don't want to do that. So I'll go ahead and click on the option right there to install Google Chrome. Uh, so right here, nothing really happens. Uh, now, if we go down to the, oh, you will see this uh, indication right here, if it wasn't being blocked by my Activate uh, Windows screen here, uh, that we're taking action. Uh, now, how do we configure this? Let's go back to Google Chrome. You can see here that I've added in my automation uh, to install Google Chrome. 
In this situation, I've actually uploaded the Google Chrome MSI into Ninja One using the install application functionality. This lets you store EXEs or MSIs or PKGs and DMGs inside of Ninja One, and then they are downloaded to the device on demand whenever they need to execute the script. Uh, so I guess that's a good point here that you will need internet connectivity for this to function. If the device doesn't have internet, uh, this is not really going to provide a lot of value. Uh, now, you can add in multiple applications here. Uh, so we could go ahead and have a series of applications, or if we're doing some sort of troubleshooting step, uh, this is going to give us the ability to have a sequence of actions occur so that we can take multiple uh, actions when we're trying to troubleshoot what the issue is. Uh, so for example, if you were deleting uh, disk space, you might want to have them empty the recycle bin, delete temporary files, maybe purge the Windows update directory for anything that's clogging up uh, the, that directory. Uh, so you can do more than just one thing. Uh, you also get that notification message, which I think you saw was a little hidden uh, down here by my activate Windows uh, tag there. So you do get an indication to the end user, or at least you can configure what the notification message is going to be to that end user. Uh, even though I'm showing this on Windows, I do want to emphasize that the SysTray does work and this functionality does work across Windows, Linux, and Mac OS devices. So this is feature parity across the board. Now let's look at this from a different perspective. Uh, let's say we want to do more of an on-demand troubleshooting action. Uh, we can see here the system performance check. I went ahead and added this script in so that they can run this on demand. Uh, and this actually... Uh, produces a notification to the end user built into the script, so I don't feel like I need to add in an additional notification message here. So if I go back here, I am then able to go ahead and also execute this action to the system performance check, like so. And I'll see this notification pop up on my screen. However, let's go ahead and back up and see what this actually looks like on the device. So if we go back to my device here, which I'm remoted into, over on the right-hand side, you're going to see that this was requested by the end user. So this is something that's distinct as an automation execution from just a regular technician running it. And of course, you're able to scrape this through the activities and report on when end users are going to be executing these actions. And so we can see all that happening over there on the right-hand side. Uh, you can see it's uh, uh, back here. We can see the system uh, performance metrics are being collected. This should take about five minutes, and then it'll be updated to that custom field. Uh, so this is just a nice way to let people know, hey, don't uh, re reboot your computer while you're in the middle of this. And then over here on the right-hand side, we can see that uh, our installation of Google Chrome has completed. Maybe, yep, we can see that there on the desktop. So we can see that Google Chrome has completed uh, and our system performance check is currently underway. So we'll get fresh information updated into our custom field. Uh, and this is useful if somebody is reporting performance issues with their device, uh, having them go and execute a check uh, so that you have actionable data that you can look at and you know try to determine what went wrong. Uh, I think that's very useful to give to the end user, to give them the ability to, to kind of create that trigger point of, hey, here's where I want data to be collected so that a technician can look at it later. Uh, so I just think a lot of value there in that system performance script, not just from the technician initiated side, but also from the end user side as well. A couple other good options here that I think would be um, useful troubleshooting situations. We had somebody earlier who wanted to uh, give an ability to connect to different printers depending on which physical location they were inside of. So if you did want somebody to have the ability to connect to a printer based off which office they were at, uh, this would be another great implementation of that so that you could give somebody that easy ability to determine which printer is currently the default one. With that, let's go ahead and move on to our next feature here. We're going to be talking about the warranty tracking open beta. Uh, again, this is something that if you're a Dell shop today, anywhere, uh, in, in any regional instance of Ninja One, go ahead and request it from your account manager. You can use this today and it's going to be valuable for you. Um, now, if you are uh, not, uh, if you use Lenovo, Toshiba, or HP, you're better served by waiting until the 6.0 release. Uh, so yes, uh, that's where we currently stand with our support of the various manufacturers. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at a different tab here uh, to see a Dell device and what this looks like with the warranty tracking. Oh, that tab had to reload. Uh, now you'll see here this device, this is a physical machine. So this is an actual Dell device. Uh, this is something that probably 
uh, will be given to another Ninja One employee in the future if it hasn't been already. Uh, now, down here at the bottom, you can see our warranty date, November 1st, 2023 through November 2nd, 2026. Let's go ahead and eliminate that. I'm going to go ahead and clear out my warranty dates like so. So now there's no information whatsoever. Uh, let's say I wanted to know what this device's warranty status was. All I need to do is click on sync with manufacturer and right there it repopulates the warranty fields. Uh, this is the exact same way that it will operate with Lenovo, Toshiba, and HP. Uh, so this is going to be very similar functionality. It's very easy to use. There's really not a whole lot that you need to do uh, to, to get this going. Uh, probably contacting your account manager to request access is the most work you're going to have to do for the warranty tracking. Uh, now, this syncs automatically every Saturday at 1 a.m. UTC today. So for anyone in America or Canada, that means late Saturday night. This syncs once a week for any updates. Um, there's no way to broadly update every single device with one click. You do have to go to each individual device right now. We do plan to change that. Uh, again, this is in a, a preview state, a beta state. So we do intend to go ahead and add things like uh, being able to do this in bulk, being able to have the warranty date sync at the initial check-in of the agent, so when you first install Ninja One. And we also have plans to add in notifications for when you are approaching the end of your warranty date. However, you can generate a report today that tells you when you have devices that are within a certain period of time of the expiration date, let's say 90 days. And so let's go ahead and take a look at how we can make that work. I'm going to go ahead and go to my warranty data table report right here. So in the device search grid, you can actually customize these columns that we see here. Uh, and in my case, I have customized the columns of warranty start date and warranty end date uh, so that we can easily see when devices are going to be in and out of warranty. Uh, now, if I modify my filters here, I can go ahead and say, well, show me when the uh, end date here is greater than or equal to, let's say 90 days. And so right there, we can see in the next 90 days, these, oh, that's not correct. We want it less than, easier for me, I know. And so right there, we can see we have two devices that are going to expire or have expired uh, within the next 90 days. And so what we can do is save that. And this might be something that we save as in next 90 days, like so. We can go ahead and save that. And then in the reporting section, I can go ahead and I can create a report. In my case, I'm going to create a data table report, and this is a CSV report. So this would be a, a spreadsheet that would be sent out. And so what I can do here is I can say warranty expiring in 90 days or less. I can create that. I can add in those columns for warranty date, like so. There's warranty start date, warranty end date. And then I can add in my group. And the group option lets me target only devices that are going to have their warranty expire or has the, the warranty has expired within the next 90 days. And so if we look here, warranty data table report in next 90 days, that's going to limit down to just those two devices uh, where we can see the warranty has already expired. And so this is something I can then send out to uh, my team on a regular basis. Uh, keep in mind here, if you are an MSP, you are going to need to create groups for each individual client so that everything filters correctly and you don't end up in a situation where the wrong people are seeing warranty information for the wrong devices. Uh, and so very handy to be able to have this sent out. Let's say every month probably is a good bet. We know what devices are going to have their warranty expiring within the next 90 days. So I think really useful. Uh, on our next trip of the 6.0 release of Ninja, we're going to talk about our new image backup. As I said earlier, this is a, a reimagining of Ninja backup on the image side. Uh, this is uh, using new technology under the hood. Uh, I think it is faster. I think it is more efficient in terms of the storage it consumes. Uh, I also think it gives you drastically more granularity with how you want to retain data uh, inside of your image backup. Uh, so like I said, this uses chainless technology now. So after the initial full backup, we're never going to have to take a whole complete backup. We're only going to be backing up what has changed from the uh, previous backup. And so that is going to ultimately save the amount of storage you utilize. It's going to deduplicate the data to, again, be more efficient. And it's also going to have that immutability so you have the confidence that none of your data is being modified uh, once it is officially in the AWS cloud. Now. One huge improvement to our image backup here is the retention options. 
Uh, so right now, this is going only to the cloud. This is a daily schedule. So every day at five o'clock, we're backing up. We can standardize this to a time zone. In my case, local device time is just fine. But you could also exclude the weekends. Very handy there because you don't want maybe false positives if somebody's machine is offline uh, over the weekend, which is totally normal and expected. Uh, and then we have our retention options. So how long do you want to retain all of this data? We initially are going to set our overall amount of data that we want, want to retain, the length of time that we care about. And so let's say, theoretically, I need six months worth of backups. I can go ahead and say I need a totality of six months. Then I can determine how many daily backups I need. In this case, it's only set to a week. I'm going to change that and say I need a minimum of three weeks of daily backups. So that means every single day I'll have at least one backup, or I'll have one backup, not at least. I'll have a single backup for every single day for 21 days. Uh, and then after that, we're going to have at least one weekly backup for the next six weeks. Uh, now you can go ahead and modify this too. Maybe I'll make this a to total of eight weeks. Uh, and then after that, we can say, all right, we're going to have a monthly backup until we hit our overall six-month limit. And so I think this is much more in line with how people are backing up in the field, what the actual requirements are for backup. And so this, I think, is a huge improvement uh, over how we were previously retaining data. A quick note here, if you are using an uh, image backup today, Ninja One backup today for images, uh, yours are going to move into the legacy folder down here. This does not impact or change your backups in any way. Your backups will continue to run. They will continue to be able to be restored. This does not impact production in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it gives you the ability to gracefully switch over to the newer uh, version of image backup. Uh, so feel free to do so at your leisure. Uh, but yes, no production backups that are currently using the now legacy model with 6.0. None of them are going to be impacted by changing over to new image backups. Just remember that you will need to start deleting those uh, legacy backups at some point after switching over to the new image backup just to make sure uh, that your bill doesn't get too high. Now, once we back up all that data, there's a few things that we can do with it. I know the primary use case for an image backup is the device has gone offline, perhaps the hard drive has failed, and we need to go ahead and do a full image restore on a server, for example. Or perhaps we have an entirely new server and we want to restore a, an image from the previous server to this new server. Uh, several different use cases there. Um, now, I think another possibility here, another uh, potential use case, is that you only really need a certain file or folder that's on the device uh, or on the image of the device. And so we can actually go ahead and mount that image that we've taken. We can take the, that image and mount it in the cloud so it becomes browsable. And we can actually look for our files and folders, and then we'll have the ability to actually um, uh, restore uh, or download the files that we need. So let's go ahead and jump into our backup manager right here. We can look for our image plan here. Note here that the new image plan names it image backup plan. Uh, so just so in case anybody's curious where their image plan is, it is under the image backup plan name. Uh, and so then I can download my image restore manager if I needed to. I can generate an image authorization key, and that would be for a full restore. I need to fully physically restore uh, a, a device. However, I can also go ahead and click into the plan. I can see the partitions that are being backed up here, when the last revision was, how much data is being utilized. And then I can actually click into this and see all my various restore points. And you can see over on the right-hand side here, we have the data scanned, we have the data stored. Uh, you can see that uh, this is you know, a relatively small amount of consumption relative to the overall size of our device here. And then I have the option, if I need to, to click on this. And then this is going to mount this in the cloud so it becomes a browsable image. Now, let's say I need this particular file here. I can select that there and then go ahead and download. And I am realizing that I am actually in the wrong instance. So you're not seeing the cool new feature that I wanted to show you. Uh, let's go back into the Canadian instance here so I can actually show you the ability to restore directly to the device. So, sorry about that bad webinaring. Right there, we have our image backup. We can go into our image backup plan. We can then go ahead and mount our C drive here and mount this recent backup from the 18th. And so now that this has uh, loaded here, when I select that, I now get the cool new option. I no longer only have to download 
the folder or file to my device and then restore it uh, through the file browser, I can restore directly to the device. And so I can go ahead and say, well, just go ahead and put this back in the exact original location, or I can go ahead and restore it to a different location. So that way, um, you know, in case they happen to need that file for whatever reason, it's not impacted or overwritten. Uh, so I just think this is an incredibly useful uh, feature, um, you know, uh, to be able to just re directly restore to the device. We've been able to do it with our file and folder backup, but this is a really nice enhancement on the image side as well. Let's go ahead and move on to our next option here. Good to see that uh, some people are saying they're using the warranty tracking and it works great. Uh, a question on HP. HP is going to be in the 6.0 release. So 6.0 is going to uh, give you Toshiba, Dell, uh, Toshiba, Dell, Lenovo, and HP. We currently support Dell today, so we're adding on three manufacturers with the uh, next release. A question here from Jeremy. It would be cool to put something in the sys tray uh, to put like a raise my hand and have a spot in Ninja to show that the person needs help instead of just finding the device just tell the user to raise their hand. Uh, so you will be able to do this with the SysTray uh, script execution. Uh, previously, when we were using the launch command in the SysTray, this meant that you were running in the context of the user. But the SysTray script execution, you can determine the credential. Is it the current logged on user? Is it system? Is it some other credential like an admin credential? And so now that means that when somebody clicks something in the SysTray, you can have it right into a custom field. So if you have a hand raise custom field in Ninja, you can go ahead and have them raise their hand. And then in the device search grid on the uh, left-hand side, you can customize those columns so that that hand raise custom field is visible and it makes it easier to identify devices when uh, they need attention. So I certainly can see the value in having that as native functionality, uh, but I do think, Jeremy, that that would be a, another good option there um, to, uh, to functionality. All right, now, uh, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. We'll go ahead and move on to uh, our next feature that we're looking at, which is Ninja One documentation. Uh, so Ninja One documentation is a great way to store your institutional knowledge that's tied to your, your team, to your customers inside of the same platform where you're already managing those devices. Uh, this has three you know, main subsets of functionality. One is documentation, and these are the documents that you can uh, store tied to each separate uh, organization. Um, you can see here that we have quite a few in this, uh, this instance here. Uh, I'll show off some of these in a little bit. Now, these can uh, be created. Uh, you can add in your own template right here. We give you some templates uh, out of the box, but we can go ahead and have true customization here. So any type of field that we want to include, uh, it, maybe it's an attachment, maybe it's a simple checkbox to denote a yes or a no. Uh, maybe it is a link to other devices in that organization. Maybe it's links to organizations or links to locations. It could be secure fields that require MFA to reveal the contents. Uh, and it could also be that WYSIWYG field that I mentioned earlier. You can store up to 200,000 200, characters of data inside this WYSIWYG or what you see is what you get field. Uh, and so it allows the storing of uh, JSON files, of, um, uh, like I said, custom formatting through uh, HTML and supported CSS classes as well. So a lot of ability to create uh, your uh, documents through the GUI here. You can also create this all through the API. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but Ninja One documentation can be fully managed through the API, whether it's documents, whether it's checklists, or whether it's the knowledge base. So I think that, that is tremendously useful. Uh, the other option here would be a checklist. Uh, so let's say we need to uh, give somebody a, a series of steps to follow. Um, and so we've enhanced checklists. Uh, this is really the reason why documentation is now officially GA is because of enhancements to checklists. Uh, there are now notifications so that when you are assigned a checklist, that actually goes to the user's email with a list of all the steps that they need to undertake for this particular checklist. Uh, so that is nice. There are now notifications for that by email. You're going to see that. You can also take the, uh, the checklist and you can assign the individual tasks inside a checklist to a uh, different users. And so if we come in here, you can see what this looks like. Now here's our daily system health check. And I have a series of six steps, and this is supposed to be completed every single day. 
verify all servers are operational and responsive, check disk space on critical servers. So I just need to go down this list here. This has been assigned to me. So I got an email saying you have these six steps to, uh, to uh, take. Now you can also add individual assignees here. So let's say it's my job to take care of the first uh, few steps. And so I can go ahead and add in myself here. I can choose to send an email notification to myself if I want to blow up my inbox. There we go. And I can assign. But if I need to assign other tasks to other users, you now have that granularity. It's now not just one size fits all where one person is responsible for the entirety of the checklist. You can take these individual steps and start to break them out. Uh, there are now uh, due dates as well. So we can go ahead and add a due date and say that this has to be accomplished by a particular date. Uh, email notifications for that as well. And you can also expand this. I kept this pretty bare bones. There's not really a lot of, of meat on the bone, to, uh, so to speak. Uh, but you could also include additional descriptions, additional formatting here. Uh, very easy to, uh, to create the sort of standardized checklist that everybody is following for those types of procedures. Now, let's say I need more information here. It's not just enough to, let's say, check disk space on critical servers. Perhaps I need more information on how to do that. Over on the right-hand side, you will see related items. The related items are the ability to spiderweb different things across the entire Ninja One platform so that you can easily get to go where you need to. Uh, so in this case, I think I might need to go ahead and leverage a knowledge base article here. And so I can go ahead and find a knowledge base article. Uh, and this will provide a quick link to this so that whenever I need to check critical disk, uh, disk space on critical servers, I have an article over there on the right hand side that I can easily get to. Uh, so the related items really are incredibly valuable here. Uh, we can see we have attachments we might want to reference, links to devices, links to organizations, links to documents inside of Ninja One documentation, knowledge base articles, or even other checklists. So if you want to have sort of a nested functionality where there are actually multiple checklists that you need to uh, cross-reference tasks between, you can definitely do that. Uh, we can reference technicians, and then we can also reference secure fields. Uh, secure fields are very valuable. They might contain your typical username and password. However, in 6.0, we have a new feature here, which is the ability to include temporary one-time passwords or TOTP codes. So you actually put the one-time password seed in here, and then technicians are going to be able to come and uh, view uh, the TOTP code uh, on demand uh, without revealing the seed. Uh, so you can put the seed in there. The seed is not going to be exposed in any way, uh, but the temporary one-time password that results from the seed, that'll be something that your technicians have the ability to pull up on demand. This is also protected by MFA as well. So you will need to enter MFA uh, in order to view this and confirm that you are who you say you are, not just somebody who uh, is kind of passing by somebody else's laptop. So let's actually switch gears here a little bit. And I wanted to take a closer look at Ninja One documentation and what you can do with it. Because much like custom fields, documentation is extremely custom. I very much doubt that people are going to be documenting and tracking the exact same things across the board. Uh, it's going to be unique to your particular uh, use case and your particular situation. Uh, but let me show you a few different examples that I've come up with that I think are valuable here. Uh, let's go into, let's say, Enterprise North. And then I'll go to the documentation. Now you'll see here the checklists. If you have any checklists that are organization specific, keep in mind that with checklists, you can create a uh, sort of global template that applies to all organizations. And then you can import and modify that uh, per customer in case you do have unique processes for different customers. So it's absolutely very flexible across uh, all your various organizations. Uh, we have the same for our knowledge base here. So any knowledge base articles that are uh, specific to this particular client, I can go ahead and store those here. You do also have the global knowledge base, which is for processes and procedures that are applicable to all of your managed devices and not specific to a, a particular organization. And then we have our apps and services. And so this is where we create our document cards where we can store information. Uh, you can see here we have a Bitdefender Gravity Zone one. Uh, we have our SIP one here. Uh, SIP is the CyberDrain Improved Partner Portal, and it's really designed for managed service providers to be able to more easily manage Microsoft 365 environments in a multi-tenant manner. 
Uh, but if you are not an MSP, uh, single tenants can also use SIP. And I do think that there's some value there uh, in, in the platform. Uh, and so what SIP is doing is creating individual documents here for our various uh, users in this particular organization. And it gives us some uh, useful information here. You can see the HTML and CSS formatting that I mentioned here, a quick and easy links to Entra, to Intune. Uh, we can go into SIP to view the user or edit the user and we get information on their mailbox details. What's their principal name here? Uh, what's their user ID? So it's just nice to have all this information easily accessible inside of the platform. Uh, another thing that I've been playing around with has been a cumulative patch update report. This actually uses the API, uh, the Ninja One API, to scrape this information and then create this document. This is what I meant earlier when I said that uh, the API can completely control and manage all aspects of documentation. You can create the templates, you can create the documents, you can delete them, you can update them. Uh, everything can be managed through the API. And so in my case, I have something set up to track for the monthly cumulative update right here. Uh, looks like we're doing pretty good so far, 88%. Only one device currently has a cumulative update outstanding. You can see it's this one device here. I've also created links, so these are all clickable. So if I needed to, I can click on that device. It'll open up a new tab. And then in theory, all I need to do is go and uh, hit the play button so that I can execute my OS patching. So that's a nice one, uh, patch installation reports, same basic concept. I wanna see every patch that has installed for this organization. I get that all on a line item here with my device like so. And I also get some patch statistics up here near the top. So very handy. Uh, over on the right hand side, you can see an example of what I meant earlier with these related items. I have a knowledge base article. The reason I have this here is so that in case anybody is curious about how to generate this, uh, you can actually go into our knowledge base here and you can share it. Uh, so right there, I go to share, I can create a link. I can say this is an explanation of how you can um, uh, install Windows patches. Let's say KB article creating. Let's do that. Probably doesn't make any sense. We'll have this say never expire. I will add my link in there like so. I will copy that and then I'm going to paste it in the chat. Uh, so this is just copying and pasting one I had on Discord. Uh, but if you did want to go ahead and view this, you can go ahead and see how I reference Luke Whitelock's blog here, that this requires PowerShell 7. And then there's a link to Discord there at the very bottom. Uh, so this is, uh, I think you can see the value here in having this related items, spiderweb your documentation, to your knowledge base articles, to checklists. Uh, you can very easily navigate your way around the platform. We'll actually go back into the uh, documentation section here. Uh, this is another thing that was posted on Discord. If you are not in the Discord and you are a Ninja One partner, I would strongly recommend it. Uh, I think Andrew is going to go ahead and pop a link uh, in the chat here for anyone who would like to join Discord. Uh, actually, and if uh, he doesn't, I'll go ahead and post a link there in a second. Uh, this is a uh, essentially the ability to go ahead and look for the success or failure of a script across devices. And so here I'm looking for a script that randomizes the exit code to produce a random success or a random failure. Uh, and so we can see here when we executed that script, we got five failures, we got two successes. We can see where those failures are. We can see where those successes are and we have those links to the device. Um, so I think this just goes to emphasize that documentation is going to be something that is custom to your particular setup. What you care about, what you wanna track, is going to be unique to your particular organization, and it is going to vary. Uh, the nice thing about documentation is that you do have that total flexibility to track what you care about. I'm going to switch environments again, go back into the uh, main US environment here. And one thing that's really useful uh, that we use this for is uh, for the salespeople. Uh, when they need to find something in Ninja One, you can actually use the global search bar at the very top to find it. Uh, so case in point here, I want to find Discord. So right there, I created a document on the Ninja One Discord. It has this little section right here with a link to join the Discord, which I will go ahead and pop into the chat, although I think Andrew already posted it. Uh, and this has several other, uh, uh, several other different parts of functionality. We have the SIP integration with quick links to an organization custom field that shows you what SIP provides, a device custom field. You can also see SIP data in Ninja One documentation. So obviously, this is not relevant to anybody who's watching this. This is uh, something that's only relevant to us because of how we happen to use the platform. 
But I think that's kind of my overall point here. Uh, this is the, uh, it really gives you the true flexibility to do whatever you want to do, whatever is relevant to your particular organization. Here's another good example. This is something I struggled with all the time. I traveled around to different locations. What was the IP scheme? Uh, what device goes where? Being able to uh, come in here and, and have that information at my fingertips, this would have been tremendously useful. Um, to look at it from a different perspective, another thing that I dealt with previously, and I'm saying uh, my previous position, I used to work for a movie theater for over a decade. Uh, and so we had many different locations, many different IP addresses to keep track of. Uh, and one thing we used was a program called M Remote. Uh, it was a network connections manager. And so if I was making SSH connections or Telnet connections or HTTP connections, RDP connections, I could have all my passwords and everything saved in a configuration file. And then it was very easy for me to load into what I needed to without having to enter a password every single time. Uh, so that was uh, a very useful tool. It had one downside, which is that the XML file got corrupted, not infrequently. Uh, and so what I would do in this particular case with the benefit of Ninja One now is, I would actually give my uh, end users the ability to create that configuration file on demand by retrieving information stored in Ninja One documentation to recreate that XML file on the fly. Again, an incredibly specific use case to just me. Um, but I think that, again, just goes to show the flexibility and the power that you have with documentation to solve these uh, these issues that that do crop up from time to time. All right, I can see I have about 12 minutes left. So let's go ahead and switch gears here a tad, and we'll talk about the uh, uh, some, some miscellaneous enhancements. Um, somebody says, is documentation the same as notes? It is not. Uh, device notes are very useful, uh, but they are only at the device right here. You'll see this on the tab right there. We can create a feed of notes. This is useful, but it is not documentation. That is, uh, this is something I would say is more just on the endpoint management side. Uh, question, can an end user see those documents? They cannot see those documents. However, you can grant the ability for end users to see knowledge base articles. Uh, so let's go in here to my global knowledge base, just as an example. Uh, you can see here my resources for everyone. Uh, what I can do here, in, uh, well, I have the public links. So let's say here, I want to go ahead and give somebody a list of all the custom fields that I utilize in this particular demo environment. I can go ahead and copy that there, and I can paste that into the chat in case anybody wants to see it. Uh, however, if I go back, I can actually share the entire folder with an end user. Uh, so I can come in here, share, and then I can go ahead and give this uh, to uh, people with specific access, uh, sorry, with specific roles. So right here, full access and knowledge base, anybody with that particular role, they'd be able to log in to the Ninja One platform and see all the articles in that knowledge base. So not on documentation, that is going to be technician only. But if you cross-reference that information or also put that information in the knowledge base, which is possible because the knowledge base can be managed via API too, uh, that is uh, that you would have the ability to share that with end users. And of course, you also have the public link. It really depends on how secure the information is. An end user has to log in with MFA, so that's more protected. A public link is obviously a public link. Uh, so just be sure to exercise some discretion depending on the content of the data. Somebody says they don't see KB in their portal. I would definitely reach out to your account manager on that. Uh, some miscellaneous enhancements. Uh, so I'll actually go into the release notes here to, to talk about this. Uh, this is some ticketing enhancements that I think are really valuable. Uh, number one is, do you want to see the headers on comments that are created by email? This is now an option in the general ticketing settings. Uh, there is also some improved response scenarios here where when an end user replies to an original email thread and not a ticket, uh, we're now going to add that reply into the ticket and not create a new one. Uh, we're also going to uh, make sure that replies to closed tickets are going to go to the ticket it was merged into. Uh, and then when tickets are split, all replies are going to go to the original ticket. So some much uh, needed improvement on how we are handling those responses. Um, Right there. Oh, I saw a question here. Somebody says, can you create runbooks from documentation? You absolutely can. I'll show that in just a second. Uh, and then we also have some improved options here with the system email notifications. 
real quick, let me go back in here. Uh, yes, if you do need to do runbooks, go into your reporting section. We can then go ahead and create a runbooks report like so. We can go ahead and name this. Who do you want to send it to? Do we want to include global articles, organization articles, apps and documents like so? We can do this for specific organizations. So for example, Enterprise North, and then maybe the specific template that I want here, uh, this could be my cumulative update patch report, and it could also be my patch installation report that we saw earlier. And so then I can go ahead and save that. I forgot to name it, of course, Enterprise. There we go. I need to enter more there. And that'll process as a PDF and I'll get that via email. Uh, so yes, I forgot to mention that. Very good call out. Uh, thank you, Luke, for keeping me honest there. Uh, lastly, let's talk about some early access features, some new uh, open beta features. Uh, with the 6.0 release, Zendesk and ServiceNow are both moving into an open beta status. So if you are users of ServiceNow or if you're users of Zendesk and you want to have Ninja One to be able to create tickets in those uh, platforms and then on ServiceNow uh, create configurations in their CMDB, um, you can get that open beta or that early access feature uh, with the 6.0 release. I have uh, used both of them. Uh, it's very good integration, uh, very robust. Uh, won't talk about it too much now since it is a beta feature, but I think that anyone using those platforms, you'll see a tremendous value uh, by setting up the integration inside of Ninja One. With that, I'm going to go ahead and pull up some questions and try to get to as many as I can. There are 93 questions in the Q&A. Uh, can you have tickets sent to shared mailboxes or a distro group? Uh, yes, absolutely. I was not an announcer at a previous job. Uh, no. I have a, a face made for radio, though. Thank you. Uh, recurring scheduled maintenance mode. We do have plans for that. That is something we'll see next year, Steve. Uh, John, there will be a recording of the September 24th webinar uh, that, that will be uh, recorded and it will be on YouTube. Um, the ability to send an image back up to a local device, I think that will be a, that will not be in 6.0. That'll be in a future release though. I think it might be in seven, but it could slide to eight. So I'm not entirely sure on that, Jeff. Uh, but yes, you will absolutely be able to do that in a uh, future release. Uh, if you're curious about what version of Ninja One you are currently on, hit the control key and then hover over the Ninja One logo in the top left, and you will see the current version you are on for all the various uh, components of Ninja One. So I believe, I think it jumped away, but that was somebody's question. Uh, question from Roy, how do I see if my instance is on US2 or NA? Actually, do we show that here? We don't show it in that section, but you can see in the URL, I am in the ca.ninjarmm.com instance, uh, which means I am in the Canadian instance. Uh, Chris has a question. Any plans for better import options from other documentation platforms? Yes. Um, I don't know that that is officially out now, but we do have an open source tool that's being worked on that will be uh, designed for that purpose. Uh, when will this be available in Spain? Next week, September 25th. Uh, Dale asks, will, will there be templates for documentation? Uh, there are templates that exist today inside of Ninja One documentation. Uh, just go to the administration section, apps, documentation like so, and then manage templates. You can import from our library. You can modify those templates to fit your needs. Uh, I would also say that because doc documentation is accessible via the API, uh, you know, in my case, some of the scripts that I've referenced here today, if you go on Discord and look at them, they actually create this for you. Uh, so that would be a different form of template, I suppose. Yes, a uh, question from Josh here. This is a, a good call out here. I kind of got lost in the shuffle here, uh, but there is a beta feature for network devices or NMS devices. Uh, it is command line, Telnet and SSH access to your networking devices. Again, this is in a beta state. You can see we have the flag there. 
this is going to require you to put your Telnet and SSH credentials in the credentials exchange at the organization level. Uh, you can see this under the settings that we have our credentials right there. Uh, this is not right, which is why uh, my connection was failing there. Uh, so I can't demonstrate it live, but yes, there is this functionality. It is, uh, I think, automatically on for anybody who uh, is upgraded to 6.0. Just keep in mind that it is in a beta state. Please let us know if you encounter any issues with it. Uh, yes, and a follow-up question. Raphael had a uh, question about uh, web access via tunnel. Uh, we do have that planned, but that's not going to be until next year. A question from Kaylin. Is there a list of what you can use in the sys tray to identify the device? There absolutely is. Go to the dojo here. I'll paste this in the chat and search for uh, sys tray. If I can type, that'd be great. Third time's a charm. Uh, here you have the environment variables you can use via the sys tray icon. Uh, and that should give you everything you need. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring out Andrew to announce the winner of our giveaway. Hi everyone, my name is Andrew. I'm a marketing programs coordinator here at Ninja One, and I'll be announcing today's prize winner. The winner will get to choose between a pair of AirPods Pro, a PlayStation 5, or a Surf and Turf dinner. And the winner of today's webinar is, drum roll please, Jason Jordan. Let's go. <laughs> everyone drop a huge congratulations in the chat. Uh, Jason, please keep an eye out in the following days for an email to claim your prize. Thanks. Back to you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, question from Kyle. Will you be adding dark mode? Yes. Yes, we are. That is currently in work with the design team. Uh, you will absolutely see dark mode. I don't know if it's going to make the end of this year or if it's going to be early next. Uh, but yes, uh, there is a, a whole big project reworking a lot of designs of Ninja. And dark mode is a facet of that. Um, essentially, every component, visual component, has to be redesigned from the ground up for uh, us to be able to do this. Uh, question from Alex. Do we know the pricing of warranty tracking? It is free for customers. We actually just announced that earlier this week. Uh, so yes, that's a, a great answer that I love to give. I think that honestly is something that should really stand out. That's not something that happens a lot. Uh, is, is that a feature providing that level of value that is being made available to all our customers? Um, so yes, uh, very happy that we can do that. Uh, can Ninja One documentation be integrated with Hoodoo documentation? There's no native integration there, but you could certainly go ahead and use the API to cross-reference information from Hoodoo and Ninja One documentation. Uh, let's actually go ahead and take a look at the API real quick. You go into administration, apps, the API, and then all the way down here at the bottom, after I close my help bar, uh, you will see our API here, and all the way near the bottom is when you'll see the documentation endpoints. Right there. And you can see checklists, checklist templates, document templates, organization documents, knowledge base, all managed through the API. Uh, any plans to integrate a password manager? Uh, nothing right now uh, in terms of like a browser extension is what I assume you mean. Of course, you can use the secure custom fields to hold credentials that are more relevant for uh, you know endpoint management operations. A question from Lee is, uh, can SysTray scripts be executed without internet access? Uh, they cannot. Uh, you do need to have internet in order for that to work, just like the Ninja agent requires the internet to, to function. Uh, Hayden had a question on a fresh service integration. I don't think that's coming anytime soon. Uh, Tony, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, yes, recurring maintenance mode. I cannot wait for that feature. Uh, question from Isaac, our last question of the day, because I realized I'm over time. Uh, will you be adding Microsoft Surface devices to warranty tracking? Yes, but you're going to have to wait until 7.0. 7.0 is when we expect to add Microsoft to the warranty tracking feature. Uh, with that, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me via email, first.last at ninjaone.com. Uh, and yes, thank you very much for attending today. I hope you saw some value here. Uh, I look forward to seeing everyone on the next webinar, September 24th. Uh, take care and have a good rest of your day.